The Bible reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 16. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is, so, it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thank you so much, Kelly, for reading that this morning. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, you've got a pew Bible there. It's on page 44 of the New Testament. I'll let you find that if you want to follow it. It's chapter 10 in Mark's Gospel. And it might just be helpful to follow along this morning if you've got a Bible in front of you. And our little green Bibles are there. And it's, Mark, it's page 44 in the New Testament, page 44. And Mark 10, from beginning, pretty much from the first verse. So this narrative, and it's a, we call it a pericope, it's the posh word in the New Testament of talking about a kind of a story within the bigger story, if you will. And there's a little arc in this story, and you've got Jesus talking about divorce, referencing Genesis, and then the little children being welcomed by him and him saying doesn't he those lovely words if anyone uh, doesn't enter if anyone doesn't receive like a little child they won't enter the kingdom of God you need to be like a child and this pericope this story if you will is all about mercy triumphing over judgment as we'll see and that comes from do you remember where we were preached on that just a couple of weeks ago Remember which book? James. Yeah, the book of James. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And we'll see why in a moment. But let's first have a look at the text in a little more detail. Now, if I'm honest, it's a tricky text. And I thought, oh, really? Thank you, lectionary, for choosing Mark 10 to preach on. Preaching on divorce, that's quite heavy, isn't it? And as a divorcee who is married to a divorcee, that makes it kind of difficult. I mean, really? It's kind of tricky, and if you know anything about divorce, it's never easy. It's not, it doesn't matter how amicable it is or what the circumstances are, it's difficult. I remember vividly uh, a preacher taking two pieces of paper and gluing them together. And then the glue dried, and then said, Do you know what divorce is like? And then you try and pull the two pieces of paper apart. It hurts. And it hurts. And even though in my divorce was amicable and, uh, and it, came, it was born out of trauma and uh, breakdown and all sorts of stuff happened. It was painful, it was difficult. And even though uh, it's still amicable, it, it's, it's, it's tough. And so when I come to this passage on divorce, there's always that little pang of, oh, is Jesus really saying that's it? There's a hard line in the sand, you can, yeah, and that, it, that if you kind of cross it, you're, you're forever damned or something. It, and, it, and, it, and it hurts, it hurts. But I thought this morning I'm not gonna avoid this passage, just because it might make me feel a little bit difficult, and I need to unpack it a bit. And then also, it might be difficult for, if you're a, if you're a divorcee, it might be difficult to hear this passage. If you, uh, perhaps if you 
have a difference in your sexual development, you might find it difficult. Why? Because Jesus references Genesis and God made them male and female. What if you're sitting here and you are intersex and we know that 2% of the world population are in some way intersex, maybe not visually, but maybe chromosomally or genetically, hormonally. Well, what if they're sitting here and saying, well, hang on, what about me? How do, how, where do I fit? It might be difficult for them too. But as with all scripture, context is everything. Context is everything. This is why we, are, we, we do contextual preaching, because we need to understand the why Jesus said these words, who they were being said to, and the context, if you will. We need to understand the social context. Uh, we need to understand the context of Jesus in Judaism, in the Grecio roman culture as well. But it begins with some very important words, this passage. And that is that the Pharisees were trying to trip him up. They're trying to trick Jesus. It starts with it. So whatever response Jesus is giving, he's giving it in the context that the Pharisees were trying to trick him. And then very importantly, trying to trick him in a very specific way. Because if you do look back, and the lecture it doesn't start right at the beginning of chapter 10, but if you read the very beginning of chapter 10, we discover where Jesus is preaching. In the region of Judea and, be, and, and around the Jordan, or beyond the Jordan, it says. Now, who, did, who preached at the River Jordan? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist. And what had happened to John the Baptist? Not you, Lisa Dawn, because you were here at 8 o'clock this morning. You've already heard my talk. So you know all the answers. But what happened to John the Baptist? What happened? He got put in prison. And then what happened to him? He got beheaded. We're in chapter 10 of Mark. This has already happened. John the Baptist was beheaded. And why was he beheaded? What was he criticizing? Can you remember? He was... <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> He was, crit- was criticising Herod for divorcing his wife and marrying his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. So you have Jesus standing by the River Jordan. The same Pharisees have come to Jesus and they want to trip him up. Hey, maybe we can get the same thing to happen to Jesus as happened to John the Baptist. So what's the topic they're going to choose? Divorce. And so they say to Jesus, hey Jesus, is it? Lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Is it? When Jesus says, now look what Jesus does here. If you look what he does here. The Pharisees were Moses followers. So he says to this bunch of Moses followers, what does Moses tell you to do? Good answer, right? What does Moses say? You follow Moses. What does Moses tell you to do? And so they respond, well, Moses said it's okay for us to write a certificate of divorce and divorce uh, a man for to divorce his wife. And now, this is where things get interesting. Very interesting indeed. Now, let's stop for a moment in the Bible passage and look at the wider context. But you see, you need to understand that marriage back then was not the same as it is now. When we read, into, when we read the biblical text, we read it through the lens of our culture. That we can't help ourselves. And when we read about a man and a wife coming together, when we read the Bible, we have any references to husbands or marriage, we think about marriage in our context. We think about marriage that's born out of love, a marriage that's equal, where a woman is free to choose her husband and her husband is free, free to choose his wife, or a couple are uh, free to choose each other in their relationship. But not so in first century Palestine. And it is so far removed from our culture that it's hard to get our heads around. You see, back then, women had no rights. They had no rights. It's difficult enough today having equality, but back then it was horrendous. Marriage was a contract between a woman's father and the man she was going to marry. It was a contract. And it was there for good reasons. It was born out of the need to make sure that land and property was passed down from generation to generation, that the farmstead or the business would stay in the family. But it was a contract. And the woman had no rights in this contract. They had no rights. You had no right to property, no right to possessions, no right to wealth. And you've got to understand that in Judaistic culture, that 
Although God's heart was for the marginalised, it was possible for a man to simply abandon his wife. And if he did that, she became used property, she became destitute, she became poor. She had no way of, uh, no means to sustain herself in society. And there would have been a great amount of shame because no one was going to ask her why he did it. And so Jesus responds back and says, you know why Moses put it into law? Because of the hardness of your hearts. Because just to try and make it a little bit more difficult for you to divorce, at least you've got to provide a certificate. It wasn't enough. It's nowhere near enough. But this is why he did it. Not, he was trying to make it so you'd stop and think, so you couldn't just abandon her. At least you had to have some reason to do it, some good reason, and you'd have to stand before a judge who would go, yes or no. But still, even so, even though that law was in place and Jesus references it and the Pharisees reference it, it was a patriarchal society. Women had no rights. But it gets more interesting than that in a minute. It gets more interesting than that. Because Jesus, by talking about divorce in this way, and says that a man and a woman have come together, he is actually affirming the equality of women. And you might be thinking, really? Is he? He is. Because he goes on to say, and he goes, the disciples find him on his own. There's this little paragraph on its own that's a bit strange. They, say, they, they ask him, don't they? They say, uh, they ask him again about this matter. And Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. What is wrong with that paragraph? She didn't have the right to divorce. There was no precedent for it. She didn't have the right to divorce. It was equivalent, I'm trying to find an equivalent, trying to get our heads around it. It's equivalent of 100 years ago saying, well, when a woman goes out to vote, Da, 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 da. Like, what? They can't. There's no precedent for it. But Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying that it matters. And what adultery means in this context is to abandon somebody. It means to leave them destitute. You see, mercy triumphs over judgment. You might have the right to divorce, but not at the expense of somebody. Not at the expense of leaving them destitute without means because God's heart is for the poor and the marginalised and the lonely and the bereft. And this is so important. And it trumps any rights you have in life. It trumps it. This is, God's, this is what God is like. And so he says, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. If you divorce each other and commit adultery, in other words, if you, if you, wanna, if you abandon them, that's what matters. And Jesus is very subtly and very, well, I'll say unsubtly, affirming the rights of women or affirming the equality of women women, and the right to women being treated fairly. And it's, and, it's, and it's radical. The early church was radical. Early Christianity was radical in its equality of all. The early church was full of women priests and women leaders and that's how it was. It was only about the 13th century that men decided to kind of <laughs> turn back the clock, if you will on a thousand years of history and become a patriarchal society where priests could only be men again. And uh, We've got a lot of work to undo, fellas. We have got a lot of work to undo to get back to the radical Christianity that Jesus uh, inaugurated by talking about his kingdom. We have a lot of work to do. And there's still work to do today, isn't there? There's still inequality. And that inequality doesn't just... Uh, isn't just for women. There's inequality in all sorts of areas of our lives. Jesus goes right back to a deeper message. He goes back, and this is really interesting. This is a slight aside and something to think about. He goes back to Genesis and says, you know, this is why God, God made the male and female. And they come together and they become one. Now the one there in Hebrew is the same one that talks about God being one. And God, without gender, says, do you know what? When, when masculinity and femininity come together, they, they somehow there's something beautiful about that because they are in, in the image of God. And Jesus says, and quoting from Genesis, and he made them male and female. Now, this is important because in the Hebrew, 
It would have made much, much more sense, if you're a Hebrew scholar here, you'll agree with me, I hope, it would have made much more sense to say God made the male or female. Think on that. He didn't. Male, male and female. That's really interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting a bit deep. Maybe I'm getting a bit deep. The point is, that the theological affirmation, if you will, is that, that mercy triumphs over judgment. Whatever rights and protection, or whatever rights you have, the protection of the vulnerable, the poor, the marginalised, the bereaved and broken, must take precedent. It must come first. The affirmation is that God embraces all. Male, female, black, white, old, young. This is what God is saying. And why, then, does Jesus follow this narrative on divorce and equality? Because he just said, if a woman can div- divorce their husband, hang on a minute, they can't. But he's saying, hang on. He's talking about equality here. Think about why he follows it immediately with the disciples telling children off and him saying, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. You need to welcome children because you need to be like children. And what is it about children? If you've got a four-year-old or a little one, what do children not see? They don't see race. They don't see gender. They don't see social class. Do they? They just play with each other. They just make friends. As Rinda reminded me this morning, she said, Gavin, they just make friends. Isn't that true? Wow, Jesus is following this story, this narrative on equality, making sure that people are looked after. And then he follows it by saying you need to be like children. Children who don't see gender, don't see race, don't see age differences, just acceptance and welcome and love. It's wonderful, isn't it? I don't know why they turn, they grow up into such horrible monsters like us. I don't know. But isn't there just a pure innocence about children and their acceptance and their welcome and their love? Unconditional. I love that about kids. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a child will never enter it, Jesus says. You see, this gospel or godly principle of mercy triumphing or trumping, if you will, judgment. It needs to be in every aspect of our lives, whether it's a global laws, secular laws, or biblical laws. It has to take precedence. It's a godly principle, and all of us need to obey it. Now, I was trying to think of examples of, of this in practice. What's one that we could all, all know about, or all kind of clock? What about the right to bear arms in the USA? You know what I'm talking about? The right to carry guns. When I was in Florida, I met a couple and they were both carrying guns. And um, they said to me, it's our right. And Helen and I said, they said, well, don't you carry guns? I said, no. <laughs> they haven't seen a gun, let alone hold one. Well, I said, how do you protect yourself then? I said, I don't need to protect myself. because, <laughs> Yeah? The right to bear arms. And they couldn't believe it. And they actually, they told us that they told their teenage son that if he was ever threatened to pop three in the chest and ask questions later. Can you imagine? We're like, okay, um, nice to meet you. Um, (laughs) They did run the local gun store, so maybe that's something to do with it. I don't know. That was in Florida. I was absolutely shocked. The right to bear arms in the United States. We know, I'm pretty sure, and I don't know if anybody would disagree with this, that if there were greater gun controls in the United States, fewer children would die from gun-related incidents. Wouldn't you, uh, would anybody disagree with that? If there, were greater gun, if there was greater gun control, if guns, you couldn't just walk into a shop and buy one, if there were controls on automatic weapons, fewer children would die. Isn't that fair to say? Isn't that fair to say? But the right to bear arms in America trumps the care of innocent children, doesn't it? Think about that just for a moment. Would it be right or true to say that the blood of the innocent is on the collective hands of those who uphold that legal right? Ooh, that's quite a hard thing to say. But maybe it does. If you hold that view, and you, then collectively, 
You're putting judgment over mercy, not the other way around. Well, take, a, 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 take another example. And this is closer to home, this is closer to my heart, and you've heard me preach on this before. My friend, uh, this is where I get very welly up, you know me, big softy. Well, my best friend Tom, in school, committed suicide because he was intersex, or he had a different, um, a difference in sexual development. Some people like the word intersex, some don't like that word. And he committed suicide because he wasn't accepted by society, because he was neither male nor female, and he killed himself. And I didn't know this. Okay, I knew that he was slightly different, but I didn't know why he was slightly different. That he committed suicide because he could not face society. And forever afterwards, I'm thinking, do you know, had I, if I'd known, would it have made a difference? He was my best friend. I didn't know this about him. But it have made a difference, and it hurts to this day. The American Academy of Pediatrics, secular organization, and the American Psychological Association recently reported that just over 20% of sexual minority teens attempted suicide. This is back in 2017. Back in 20, 2009, it was slightly higher than that. 2007, rather. Back in 2017, it was just over 20%. That's a horrendous statistic. And it's nearly four times higher than it is for heterosexual teens. And you know why? It's because of society who tells them they should be cisgender and heterosexual. Remember, 2% of the population, world population, they estimate, up to 2%, have a difference in biological sex. So I'm not talking about choices here, just the biological difference. Do you know who the biggest proponent of cisgender heterosexuality is. What organisation? Have a guess. Church. 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 Perhaps the most damning statistic of all. And there's a good statistic and a bad statistic. The good statistic actually is that for cisgender, heterosexual, faith-based teens, those in our churches, the, the attempted suicide rate is lower than the 6% out there in the general population. That's amazing. That's to be congratulated. But perhaps the most horrific statistic is in, in the church, it's higher than the 20% for those sexual minority children. The suicide attempt rate is higher in the church than in the general population. That, my friends, that is awful, dreadful, disgusting. And why it matters, and why preachers like me preach about it, because it matters, because lives are at stake. It's a life and death issue, isn't it? It's worth thinking about, isn't it? If you agreed with me that maybe for gun control, that to have that right would save lives, maybe there's a message for us too in the church. It's why I'm an advocate, it's why I'm an ally, it's why I preach about it, because it matters. I was chatting to a friend of mine recently, and the pressure to assign sex to some who are, who are going to be intersex for their entire lives. Perhaps they don't have, uh, can't produce the right hormones, perhaps their cells don't have the right receptors. The pressure to assign them is not because they themselves need to be assigned, it's because of culture, because they won't be accepted otherwise, and it's probably going to do them more harm than bad not to be, not for themselves, but because of us and how we would treat them. That's the truth. And that's hard, isn't it? We've made some massive progress in the last 20, 30 years, massive progress to accepting people and it's still a journey for a lot of us, it's still difficult for a lot of us to accept or try and understand but the fact that we're trying, but the guiding principle underneath all of it is what? Mercy triumphs over judgment, it has to, 
Because that's what God's heart is like. God cares for the poor, the marginalised, the broken, the lost, the hurting, the forgotten. This is who God is. It's why Jesus makes it an important message. It's why James echoes it as an important message. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take it from James who said this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law of liberty. The law of freedom, James says. Because judgment without mercy could be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Wow, talk about strong language. And then he finishes, doesn't he, with the, the line that we all know now. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Friends, let's be merciful. Let's go from this place. Let's be the people of God's mercy. Let's show love and acceptance and mercy. Let God work out the rest. So this week, may you be Jesus to everyone you meet. May you act with mercy. Amen. Amen. Amen.